Well, hello. My name is Jody Skulls. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course, and I am delighted to be with you today. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about best business practices. Yeah. So business practices. Um, and let me just see what else we're going to be talking about. All right. Do, 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 do. All right. Got to make sure all my, all my ducks are in a row here. So we're going to be talking about best business practices. We're also going to be talking about uh, business entities. Uh, we're going to be going walking right through uh, what is on your content outline of things you might be tested on. Uh, but before we get started, um, I wanted to reintroduce myself again. My name is Jody Skulls. I've been a licensed massage therapist for mm, over 20 years, almost 30 years. And I come from being adjunct therapy at um, a massage program, a community college-based massage program. And what I found was that that last hurdle, that last speed bump to just get over that, that it was really helpful to have somebody who is your accountability buddy and also framing in exactly what it is you need to study. And that's where I come in. So we're going to go through three parts of our class. The first part is a test taking strategy. It actually helps you with the physical test. Most of us have never taken a two hour test online. Maybe you did your SATs. Good for you. When was that? 10 years ago? Longer? SATs, PSATs? But in our adult lives, we just don't have a lot of reason to sit down at the computer, focus on answering questions for two hours. And so we talk about a test taking strategy. So we talk about those test taking strategies in part one. Part two, uh, we are going to do some learning and today it's business practices. About 15% of your tests, so about 15 questions will be on business practices. And then at the end of class, we take our knowledge and we apply it by dissecting questions, uh, dissecting questions that have to do with the content that we have just covered. So, um, so very first step in today's course, and that is to walk you through what it is going to take to apply to take the MLEX. And I've been speaking with a few mm -hmm. graduates lately. been speaking with a few graduates lately and their school did not walk them through what it takes to apply for the MBLEX. Let's just walk through it briefly so you know what to expect. The Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards hosts the content for your MBLEX. They came up with the MBLEX, the Massage and Body Work Licensing Exam. And so they are the ones you are going to register with. So the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards, that's the FSMTB.org. So the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards is who you pay your money to. It's 265 bucks. That kind of stinks, um, but 265 bucks and you are registered to take the exam. So you'll register with the Federation paying them the $265. You do that by creating your username and password so you have a profile. You fill out your profile, that de determines where you're gonna be taking your exam by your zip code. Um, and then once you have paid your fee, in about three to five days, you get your authorization to test, AAT, and that comes via email. So be watching your email over the next three to five days when you get your authorization to test. That authorization to test gives you the instructions on picking your date. So you are going to go to a Pearson View Testing Center to take this test. I'm deciding whether or not I want to walk you through what it's like on test day, but 
I want to walk you through how you get to test day, okay? Uh, so you will register with the Pearson View Testing Center and pick a date. Typically that date should just, that, that should be on your calendar and it, it is an important date. If you need to change the date, sickness, you know, whatever, um, then you will need to be in touch directly with the Piercing View Testing Center. They usually require at least 24 hours notice. Some require more. You cannot change your test date on test day. If there are extenuating circumstances, they will listen. Um, if there was, you know, on your way there, there was a car accident, you woke up very sick, you may or may not be able to reschedule. So best to make sure that you are prepared on test day. And some of the things we've talked about to prepare, but let's walk through this one more time from where you are right now. You will log in or create a profile at the Federation of State Massage Therapy Board's website, the fsmtb.org. And I'll put that in the description. I'll put that in the comments today too. Um, you go to their website, you click on Emblex, you click on application. Once you've created your user profile, you'll be able to register and pay the fee. Once you've paid the fee, three to five days later, you will get an authorization to test. That authorization to test will give you directions on how to choose a testing center near you. Once you have chosen, once you've received your authorization to test, you have 90 days. That authorization to test is good for 90 days. So go ahead and select your date. When you're feeling within 30 days of being ready, go ahead and select your date and try and keep your date. I've heard some graduates tell me they were able to change their date. I've had other graduates tell me they weren't. So it really depends on your Pearson View Testing Center. And that is how you register and get to test day. And on another uh, episode of what, uh, in another class, we'll talk about game day prep, what I call game day prep, being ready for your game day, um, what to do, not only in your studying, but in preparation for a game day, how you can best be prepared and can control what you can control. So. Let's move into our actual learning for today. You ready? Yeah. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the MBLEX Review Course Business Practices. And you see this thing here? This is when I took a test. I took a national exam back in 1994. It was the, um, the equivalent of the MBLEX then, but you know what? It was fill in the dots with a number two pencil. Crazy, right? That's why I have this little picture here. Because thank God you don't have to fill in the dots with a number two pencil, right? Hey, we have progressed, but today we're gonna be talking about business practices and business and procedures. Now, this is not going to be on the MBLEX, so I'm going to um, discuss this at another time, but just know that once you pass your MBLEX, I have business classes for you. I do. I've got five modules. Uh, I've got policies and procedures, something to help you launch into your first year of practice. You don't have to make up all this stuff on your own, everything from your health intake sheet to your cancellation policy. Um, to helping set your rates, to finding a job, to deciding if you want to do on-site massage. I don't know if you learned that in massage school either, but just know that I'll hold your hand even after you've passed the MBLEX to make sure that you're successful in your first year of practice and, and forward. Like I said, I've been practicing over two decades. So, all right, here's where we're going today. 
The guidelines for a professional practice will be about 15% of your tests. This is as documented on the Federation's content outline. And this is directly from the content outline. Today, we're going to be talking about um, proper and safe use of equipment, practitioner hygiene, sanitation and cleanliness, safety practices, um, body mechanics. We're going to be talking about draping. We're going to be talking about business practices. We're going to be talking about documentation and client records. And we're going to be talking about, we actually are not going to be talking too much about healthcare terminology today. I realized that needed to be a separate class on its own because there's a lot of it. So coming soon, coming soon to a class near you. All right. But that's a lot for today. So this is what we'll be specifically covering. Very first thing we're going to talk about today is a reminder about practitioner hygiene and sanitary hand washing. Since COVID, we've learned a lot about how germs spread, right? And so COVID, uh, the COVID-19 virus uh, was spread through the air on doorknobs, um, so it was stationary on desks, um, but also hand-to-hand -hand and airborne as well. So sanitary hand washing is the very, very best way to protect yourself from bacteria and viruses. Some sicknesses are caused by bacteria, some are caused by viruses. The very best way to keep yourself healthy, sanitary hand washing. Have you changed your hand washing style since massage school? Have you changed your hand washing style since COVID? Here's a reminder of the five steps. The five steps are go ahead and wet your hands with clean water. It doesn't have to be warm, hot, or cold works. Um, and after you've wet your hands, go ahead and turn on turn off this, the um the tap. That may not be part of your normal protocol, but go ahead and apply the soap. Flather your hands up. Front and back. Guys, remember the Muppet Show? That's the Swedish chef. Between your fingers. If you've got a little fingernail brush, that's great. You need to scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. And if you don't have a clock handy, that's two verses of Happy Birthday or one verse of Old MacDonald Has a Farm. So two verses of Happy Birthday or one verse of Old MacDonald Has a Farm. Hang out. For some of you, you'll be washing your hands longer than you used the bathroom. Then you actually sat on the pot. Rinse your hands under the clean running water. So you got to turn the tap back on. Rinse your hands under that clean water. Dry your hands using a towel or air dryer. You can turn off the tap with your elbow. If you have a towel, you can turn off the tap with a towel. Rinse off air dry, you know, this one of those little Dyson blower things, or dry your hands at that point. The key here is to use soap. And the key here is 20 seconds. Sanitary hand washing. It is um, a question that could come up on the envelopes for sure. Let's talk about cleanliness in the treatment room. We talked about sanitary um, hand washing. Consider having a checklist for your treatment room. And this checklist is a little small now that I'm looking at it, but these are things that you can do after each client. And especially if you're in a group practice, that way you know everyone's doing the same cleanliness routine. So what are you wiping down? The massage table, the headrest, the head of the table slip. So the head of the table, um, any of the vinyl covered pillows and bolsters, um, massage tables. To me, this would be an end of the day checklist, but depending on how sensitive you are to cleanliness in your treatment room, these are all areas of concern. Top of shelves, the windowsill, the clinic room door, 
the doorknobs, the light switch, your lotion containers. Um, and so you always have clean linens for each client. Uh, this would be the headrest cover, the table sheets and the towels. Um, you're not putting up new curtains in your room, but if you are in a clinic setting, you may pull a curtain and they may require you to change that curtain. All right, so looking at your reception area, uh, the main door, the doorknobs, the light switches, any flat surfaces. So these are all examples of cleanliness in the treatment room and in your office setting. I'll go ahead and add this checklist uh, to our patron as an attachment um, so that you can have a copy of it yourself. Let me also mention here that for the therapists, this one down here, are you a therapist that gets really warm when you practice? If you're seeing more than a couple clients, consider bringing an extra shirt. A lot of the guys that I worked with brought an extra shirt. They would wear one in the morning, one in the afternoon. <laughs> For many of them, one before lunch, one after lunch, because they almost always spilled. But you want to have a clean, neat appearance. Some people prefer to wear scrubs. This speaks to one of our standards of practice, which is professionalism. How are you demonstrating professionalism? One of the ways you're demonstrating professionalism is having a clean treatment room. Clutter, sorry guys, sorry gals, clutter is not perceived as clean. It's not a part of a clean treatment room. Please have a second set of eyes. Take a look at your treatment room, where you're treating. Hey, look, you may, I mean, I walked into a gym the other day and the massage table was like in the middle of the workout floor and she just had a curtain. I couldn't tell where the bathroom was. I don't know if that was an ideal setting, but understand that your clients are going to perceive your professionalism based on your appearance and your treatment room. And so be intentional about that. So consider having a second shirt just in case you spill. Um, also, you know, if it's summer and it's hot outside, you might sweat. Always using new face cradle covers. Sometimes you'll be using disposable face cradle covers, um, but having fresh face cradle covers for each of your um, clients as well. Let's move along. I think we understand now cleanliness in the treatment room. <laughs> Ooh, let's talk about body mechanics. So body mechanics in your treatment room. Uh, changing uh, gears a little, how do you show up in your treatment room? Did you have instructors that corrected your body mechanics? There are important parts to this. Let's take a look here. So let's start with table height. It's not labeled on this uh, image. I'd like to give credit to Sandy Fritz uh, in her 2009 version of her book. Um, that's where proper body mechanics, this image, this was published in um, the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapy. So thank you for the image. Uh, so let's take a look at this table height. The table height, if you make a soft fist, you remember this from school? You make a soft fist and stand. When you stand, that table height will be at the bottom of your soft fist. Double check your table heights to make sure you're not too high or too low. If you have the benefit of an adjusting table, a hydraulic table that adjusts on its own, once the client gets on the table, you may have the, you have the option to adjust it. But making sure that that table height is right for you to start. So right at the bottom of your soft fist. Let's take a look at these angles. So here we see stacked joints. And this is a question you may get on the emblex. 
So stacking the joints, wrist, elbow, shoulder. That creates a lever or a lever effect. And that allows your back foot to actually control the weight. We'll see this demonstrated in just a few minutes, but here's this stacked joints, weight is on the back foot, moving towards the front foot. Now you're gonna start in what we call warrior one, um, that's a yoga position. So this knee isn't quite bent yet when you first put your hands on them. But bending of the knee is what creates the force. This front foot, this bending of the front knee creates the force. All right. Again, we see these stacked joints, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle. There we go. And in general, there's little to no weight on this front foot until the very end of a long stroke. So practice this the next time you're doing massage. Body mechanics are super important for the longevity of your career. Too many therapists who graduate school end up with carpal tunnel or shoulder pain. The movement, our massage, does not come from our shoulders and arms. It actually comes from our body weight. And I have a video for you to demonstrate this in just a moment. Here's another image. This is an actual photograph and this is in sideline position. So we lengthen the spine. Go ahead and lengthen your spine right now. Imagine there's a string on the top of your head pulling you up just ever so slightly. Are you sitting up straighter? Yes, lengthen your spine. So we're doing that while we're actually doing massage treatments as well. We see again, the stacked joints. In this case, this arm, we're not applying direct pressure with this arm, but the movement is still coming from the back foot and very little weight. One of the, the games that you can play in your treatment room is can you lift your front foot? Can you just like, it, it should be there just for balance, unless you're at the end of a long effleurage stroke. So we're balancing our shoulder, elbow, and wrist. Typically that'll be straight especially as we go to apply weight. And you see, this is a person laying in sideline position. And that's often the case with pregnancy massage. So making sure that you are not compromising your body mechanics, even if you're working in sideline position, say with pregnancy massage, those body mechanic rules still apply. If you twist yourself into a pretzel, that is just gonna take up too much energy from you as the practitioner. And let me mention, as I do sometimes, that in giving massage, don't give 110%. Pump the brakes around 80%. If you're used to giving 110%, turning yourself inside out, going a little longer. Oh, really like turning and twisting to try and get those little spots. Stop that now. Stop it. Hashtag stop it. You will simply be burning yourself out. Your 80% is more than enough. I promise you. Your 80% is more than enough for that client. So reserve some of that energy for later in the day, another client, whatever it happens to be. But that's having good boundaries. 
Let's go ahead and switch gears for just a moment. I am going to change. This is a friend of mine, uh, Rebecca Faraway. She is the owner of Zion Massage School in Utah. We're going to pause this share for just a moment while I change screens. I gotta get myself ready. All right, share with sound. And we've got about uh, three minutes of Rebecca demonstrating body mechanics. Hello, massage therapy friends. As many of you know, much of our massage therapy comes from the martial arts traditions and the yogic traditions, the Shaolin monks, from China, the yogis from India, the Kalari Payatu, the Katakali dancers, and of course, Muay Thai fighters. So these traditions from all around the world. So it's no surprise that when we do massage therapy that we have a responsibility and that we're gonna be much more effective if we're using really good body mechanics because these are tied to those martial arts traditions that teach you how to use your body in a fluid way, how to root down through the earth, have that power extend through your legs, have it extend through your upper body and through your arms. And so when you actually start working with the client, this is a very supported movement and it's never using force. It's always using solidity and relaxation. In China, this is called conserving chi. In India, this is called the law of least resistance. So we have just two stances that we primarily use in massage therapy. We have this horse stance and we sink down through the earth and maybe we're doing some petrissage with this, but we want that movement to come through our whole body. We should never be working like this. It'll tense our arms, it'll tense up through our neck, supported. Okay. This will support your health and you'll get better results with your clients. If you start feeling tired, Throughout your day, this is where we start to, you know, revert to just muscling things, we call it, where we're not supporting our movements, where we're just working in isolation. So return, relax, soften more, okay? And then the other stance that we have is our warrior stance. And so we're in a lunge with our movements and we have this pressure come from the earth into our, our arm or into our forearm and gliding and then pivoting and then gliding back and pivoting and gliding. When yoga instructors, martial artists, uh, when Muay Thai fighters come into the program with me at the massage school that I have, they advance very quickly because they understand this foundational principle. So those of you that are just learning this, spend some time practicing yoga, qigong, or just with these two movements, really grounding into the earth, softening your body, and allowing yourself to work in a way that is more effective, but also easier. So law of least resistance, conserving chi, moving your body as a full unit. Okay, see you soon. For information on becoming a licensed massage therapist, visit zmc.edu. Does that sound familiar? The horse stance and the warrior stance, warrior one. Maybe if you've done yoga or you've done Tai Chi, that sounds familiar. You may be hearing it for the first time, but I'll post that video and others uh, in the Patreon site so that you can revisit those body mechanics. So, so, so important uh, for um, how to move, how to shift your body. Yes. Angie says, gosh, I wasn't taught a lot about mechanics. I know sometimes, sometimes that gets lost in the, in the shuffle. Uh, and that's why we revisit it, um, for your emblex. So, you know, the principles of body mechanics, um, but also you can see it in action. You can imagine it 
for yourself. That weight from the back foot moving forward. Yeah, and that forearm. So practicing either Tai Chi, yoga, this will help you understand the way the weight distribution moves. Let's go ahead and get back to our to our um, to our PowerPoint. Oops. We'll move through. There we go. So thank you to Rebecca Faraway from Zion Massage uh, College. Uh, she's terrific. And as you can see, understands um, how to demonstrate body mechanics very well. The next topic I want to cover with you is a little review about draping. And here we see actually two good examples of draping. Uh, let me tell you, there's lots of examples of not so good draping. And I'm not really a big good or bad person. I say kind of that's correct or we can do better. And so I want to point out to you, this is called the diaper drape. And so why I like the diaper drape for legs, just imagine being able to work on that leg, right? Oh my gosh, you got the whole hamstring available. So yummy. Um, but see how this is tucked under and there's a nice clean line with no peekaboos, no draft. All too often, I've seen massage therapists either take that sheet and drape it under the opposite leg or just kind of bunch it up, bunch it up in the middle. Not cutting it, guys, not cutting it. And also, if you are asked a draping question on your emblex, you will need to understand what is secure draping? Secure draping is when you tuck. And a little helpful hint, if you put your palm down and then tuck, a lot easier. A lot easier than trying to scoop it. So palm down and then tuck. So, and you're gonna do so on both sides. Now, if you're a little timid, maybe um, there isn't great rapport with your client yet, you may want to go ahead and just tuck under the knee and then pull that sheet through. Pull that toward you under the knee, again, giving a nice secure boundary. No peekaboo, no drafts. Have you ever had a massage where you kind of felt a draft in between your legs? And you're like, oh, I wonder if I'm securely draped. Well, if you're thinking that, what's your client thinking? We are, we drape to build trust. We drape securely every visit. Here's another example down here. Um, this is a, a massage therapist who's going to be working in an area of the body called the décolleté. It's French, la di da, right? If you're an esthetician, uh, if you're both a massage therapist and an esthetician, that's a familiar term for you, but décolleté is here. And as you advance in your massage career, you'll be working not only the, the occipital ridge, so you'll see where this massage therapist is positioned, but you'll also be working around the clavicle and maybe even into that first and second rib below the clavicle. It's so good. Oh, so good. But draping is an issue. If that sheet is just draped over the person and it's not secured at all, and you start working under the clavicle, is that drape going to move? Maybe. And we don't want that drape to move. So in this case, the client's arms are out and they're over the, um, over the sheet. But if your client is chilly and wants to remain under the sheet, another option is to just tuck under the outside, the lateral arms. Go ahead and just tuck that a little. Remember, um, well, I don't know if you had this done, but have you ever tucked in a little kid into bed? It's very comforting. It's very nurturing. And it's secure. It keeps the client warm. These are reasons that we do this to build trust, to build rapport, and also so we don't have any slippage. 
If you are doing cross gender massage, if you're a male massage therapist and you're working with females, for example, females really appreciate secure draping. It lets them know where you're gonna go and where you're not gonna go, especially if it's a new client. But draping is important all the time, even if it's your hundredth visit with a client. Look, I still securely drape my mother. Honestly, it's that important. It allows the autonomic nervous system, it allows our central nervous system to relax. Enough about draping. Let's move on to scope of practice. So scope of practice is defined clearly. We've talked about scope of practice in the past, but I want you to see it in the legal terms. So this is what a massage therapist may do when performing massage. Number one, you can use hot and cold. You can use hydrotherapy, um, heat therapy, uh, external applications of herbal or topical preparations not classified as prescription drugs. So if you wanted to use an oil infused with lavender, if you would like to use some essential oils in your practice and you're trained in it, you're allowed to do that. You don't have to have a certificate of aromatherapy, but you do have to be familiar with the outcomes that you'd like to achieve. So uh, you're also allowed as a massage therapist, it's within the scope of your practice to analyze posture. We talked in one session about a postural analysis using the wall chart, maybe hung on the back of a door. So you can create, do an analysis of posture. You can also do an analysis of movement. So if you would like to watch your client walk down the hallway to assess their, their gait, you're allowed to do that. Provision of education and self-care and stress management, that's a fancy way to say, you're allowed to offer education on self-care. If your clients are drinking, you know, 10 Diet Cokes a day, and you're like, hmm, might be better if you added some water, you might improve, that's okay, but would you like to improve? You know, if your client is looking to improve their situation, then you can offer insights into what you know to be true. So, and also in dealing with stress management, if you wanted to talk about breathing, we're not gonna be doing breathing exercises with them per se, unless you're trained in transformational breath. So provision of education, that just means sharing of information, sharing of education as it relates to their self-care and their stress management. This is not exercise. This is not nutrition, unless you're certified in that. Finally, in the scope of practice um, is the performance of techniques in which you've been trained. So intended to positively affect systems of the body. That's considered the scope of your practice. So the scope, if you had a, if you had a telescope, you could see something specific, right? Or you could see it closer. That's the scope of our practice. I wanted to compare that to the standards of your practice. So the standards of practice can be defined as the benchmark, like the expected level of care. Now, you may not have the highest standard. You may not have you know, all the knowledge of someone who's been practicing for 50 years, but there is a standard of practice that by going to massage school, you will meet. And there's different standards of practice. There's actually six altogether um, that the uh, National Certification Board outlines. Um, but this standard of practice is used to de decide on competency. One of our standards of practice, we pass the Emblex. Well, it's actually not officially a standard. Some states have other tests to pass. Um, but this is basically the benchmark that you need in your town 
county, state, province, that standard, that level, that benchmark to demonstrate that you are competent and that you have a certain level of excellence. Who is the NCB, by the way? I always just say NCB versus the whole thing. The NCB is the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. They're a national association for massage therapists. You may have already heard of the AMTA. You may have heard of the ABMP, but there's also the NCB, TMB, the National Certification Board. They are focused on recognizing massage therapists who have done more than the minimum. So a year into your practice, two years into your practice, if you would like to demonstrate that you have continued your education and you have done more than the minimum, you'll be considering being a member of the NCB, of the National Certification Board. This is offered, they offer, and you may have heard of this already. Have you heard of board certified surgeons? Board certified doctors. Let me look in the board certified. Yes. And so we also have the opportunity to become a board certified massage therapist. And we do that through the National Certification Board. They also, the other role of the NCB is they determine who is a, an approved provider of continuing education. As a massage therapist, you'll need to take 24 hours of continuing education in two years. Some states differ just a little bit. For example, in Florida, uh, the massage therapist license in Florida need to take a minimum of four hours every two years of human trafficking. But that's specific to Florida. Most massage therapists will need to take at least four hours in ethics. Again, the NCB is the ones who officially determine if you are certified to provide continuing education. It's another one of their roles. All right, let's move into some business practices, some vocabulary. Let's look at copyright infringement and intellectual property. These are business terms that you'll wanna just be generally familiar with in case they pop up on your MBLEX. Copyright infringement, using someone else's words, ideas, pictures, images, as if they were your own and you don't have permission. Every now and then you'll hear me say, thank you to Sandy Fritz or thank you to this person uh, for allowing me to use their images. I'm not representing them as my images, they are someone else's. I am avoiding copyright infringement. Sometimes you'll need written permission. These are mostly for images on websites, flyers, brochures, um, words that you're using um, in your website, flyers or brochures. I'm gonna just credit to where the uh, words came from or actually get permission. And also we are not allowed to just cut and paste from other people's websites. Hello, yeah, somebody else wrote that. That could be a copyright infringement. Intellectual property is, it's a legal concept and it can be applied to a multitude of different things. It can be books, it can be, an invention, it can be photographs, intellectual property. If you have taken a picture, you've created, um, you've created something, you have this intellectual property that's yours and you, it's yours exclusively. So we can't just use other people's stuff. And this specifically applies to us usually with images. Um, but it can be words, um, it can be other things, but just intellectual property. If that's somebody else's, we need permission. But that's the concept. Intellectual property is actually a legal term. 
We can't use other people's intellectual property. Moving along, I believe this is one of our last concepts before we move into dissecting questions, but I wanted to walk you through the difference between employees and independent contractors, as well as just a few different corporate entities that whether you knew it or not, you're gonna be one of those corporate entities. But let's start with an employee compared to an independent contractor. Many of you have been employees in the past. You've gotten hired for a job. You show up, they give you your hours. They maybe give you a uniform. They maybe give you some training and you're hired as an employee to perform certain tasks. As an employee, you have taxes taken out of your check. When you get your paycheck, if you worked for $20 an hour and you worked 10 hours, do you get a paycheck for $200? No, taxes are taken out of the check. And then at the end of the calendar year, usually sometime in January, an employee gets a W-2. Have you gotten a W-2 before? It says how much you made, right? On this little piece of paper, it says what you made, it, how much tax are taken out, and what you can file for to get back. Uh, so um, one of the benefits of being an employee down here in the final paragraph um, is that uh, employ your employer is required to withhold your social security and your Medicare, but they're also required to match. So you only end up paying half of the amount of your taxes. Your employer, your employer has a responsibility to match those. So for example, as employers will pay 6.2%, um, for social security and the employees pay that amount as well. So it ends up working out a little bit as an, if you're an employee. If you guys are having any trouble with the connection, feel free to log out and log back in. Let's move on to independent contractors. Independent contractors are what a lot of massage therapists end up working as. Now, if you make a minimum, when you make at least $600, your contractor, the person who has contracted you, is required to give you tax information. If you have made less than $600, you will not receive any tax documentation from the person who hired you. As an independent contractor, you get a 1099. Remember we talked about the employee getting a W-2? As an independent contractor, you get a 1099. It's also a document, but it says how much you've been paid. Now that document comes to you, but it also goes to the federal government. So the federal government knows you've been paid. And guess what? They want their taxes. Yup. So... That 1099 is a tax form and it says what you're going to be taxed on. Now, some people will itemize their deductions. Some people will take standard deductions. Um, and some people have worked that being an independent contractor for quite some time and they like being able to deduct their expenses. That's called itemizing your deductions. But at times, and let, if you're a smaller corporation, the IRS allows Americans to um, take a standard deduction. And that means you don't have to keep all your gas receipts. They're just going to give you 500 bucks as a standard deduction. You don't have to document all the rent you pay. They'll give you a standard deduction. So that's where it becomes helpful to have an accounting professional help to prepare your books and a tax professional to help prepare your taxes. Gets a little complicated as an independent contractor. I'm a much bigger fan of an employee status, um, but many massage therapists do both. Let's take a look, a quick look at the corporate entities. 
Most massage therapists, if they're not working for someone, are considered a sole proprietor. There's no forms to fill out, just you as the owner of the business, you are one. And there's no separate tax return for your massage business versus your personal income. So you still gather all your documents for the person preparing your taxes. It could be you have a full-time job that gives you a W-2, and then you have a part-time job as a massage therapist that also gives you a W-2. You're still considered a sole proprietor. It all goes under your name. And even if you rent some space and you do massage full-time, you're still considered a sole proprietor. You and your business are one. The other, another business entity is a partnership and some people go into partnership together. Uh, some paperwork needs to be filled out um, for partnerships. In fact, a partnership is a legal relationship. And the one thing I've seen come up on the MBLEX about partnerships is that the tax form for each partner does need to be prepared by an accounting professional and that form is a K-1. Now your accountant might also prepare your taxes. That's fine, as long as they're qualified to do so. But that schedule K-1 is what you get as a partner to say what you've been compensated for as a partner. So say you get compensated for your massage, but at the end of the quarter, you and your partner say, hey, we've done really well, we're gonna take a bonus. Those bonuses paid to partners are reported on the K-1. An LLC, a limited liability company, is another business entity. Uh, it does take, you do form it. It's very simple to form. It's a legal entity. It's designed to actually protect the sole proprietor, um, the personal assets of the sole proprietor. It's taxed pretty much the same. All the taxes for the LLC go right on your tax return. There's no separate filing, but it's just a legal entity that says, oh, my massage practice is Jody Skulls LLC versus Jody Skulls the individual. The last two corporations I wanna mention are the S Corp and the C Corp. Um, and the only difference is the tax difference. And in the S Corp, the owners of an S self, S sole proprietor, S, you report your, your profits and loss on your owner's tax return. So S Corp is self, sort of, kind of. The C Corp, there's a separate tax return for your business. It's as simple as that. We're gonna brush through these uh, office forms. I think I was a little ambitious in how much I thought we could cover today because uh, we still have to dissect some questions, but let's just briefly review some office forms that you'll use in your best business practices. You'll have a health intake sheet on which you'll do soap notes. Sounds familiar, right? You may have a consent to treat form, and this is normally for a minor. It could be called also the minor consent to treat form. Any client that you see who is aged 17 or under will need a minor consent form. It is also best practices that the parent or guardian is in the treatment room with you with a minor. Another form is a form called the ins informed consent. And this is permission. So it can be as easy as on your health intake sheet that they initial next to the glutes. They initial next to the pectoralis. Depending on the condition of your client, you may need to get written informed consent or ask for verbal informed consent. Pregnancy waivers. 
It does say high risk only, but I like to just have a pregnancy waiver if for our pregnant clients. Just saying, hey, I know that this is not a high risk pregnancy. They sign off on it. And in some cases, clients may need a doctor's note um, if they have uncontrolled high blood pressure, if they have had a recent whiplash. Another form you might need is a doctor's note to say that they're cleared for massage. These are all aspects of best business practices. Feel free to review the video and walk through these. Feel free to pause the video and you can walk through these on your own. How long will a licensed massage therapist wash their hands when using sanitary hand washing techniques? A, one minute, one minute or more. B, 30 seconds. D, at least 20 seconds. D, one version of happy birthday. How long? So, ah. Oh, look at everyone jumping in the chat. Great. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Now, remember, we need to read through all of the answers before we pick our answer. Now, let's also eliminate one wrong answer. If you remember, it's not one verse of happy birthday. It's two. Two verses of happy birthday. If you want to just hum it while you're washing your hands, that gives you about 20 seconds. But the, oh. <laughs> but the correct answer is letter C, at least 20 seconds. Very good. Good job. Let me just check this one other answer. Yes. Good job. We got Lauren. Yes. Paula. Yes. Deborah. Deborah. Yes. Tanya. Angie. Juliana. Um, Marina. 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 Yes. All right. Good job. All right. Next question. Marna. Proper body mechanics avoids injury. What phrase describes proper, proper body mechanic techniques? Make sure your table is at the proper height at about your belly button. Bend your knees, put all your weight on the front foot. C. Use your fingers to avoid injury. D, drop your shoulders and avoid hyperextension of the wrist. All right, proper body mechanics. Let's take a look. These are long answers, right? You've got to visualize what they're talking about. So let's take a look at letter A. And this is something you can do during your emblex. If it's just like, so start with letter A, let's see if it's right. Make sure your table is at the proper height at about your belly button. Yes or no? Oop, I see some answers coming in. Ooh, we are, we're all over the place. <laughs> this is gonna be a great question because guess what? Letter A is not the correct answer. We'll talk about why once we get to the right answer. Oh, swing and a miss. All right. So now that we've eliminated letter A, mm -hmm. so bend your knees, put all the weight on your front foot. C, use your fingertips to avoid injury. Or D, drop your shoulders and avoid hyperextension at the wrist. Think about when you were in massage school. What is the one thing you're, when you were being observed, what did your instructor do almost all the time? All right. The best answer is D. D like David. Drop your shoulders and avoid hyperextension of the wrist. Do you remember when your, your instructor would come and say, drop your shoulders because you're doing massage like this? Yeah. So... Avoid hyperextension of the wrist. Stack your joints, right? Hyperextension of the wrist is like this. It's difficult to avoid, but it is the best practice. Why is letter A not correct? 
why make sure your table height is at the proper height. Yeah, you should be making sure your table height is at the proper height. Is it at your belly button? No, mm. it's too high. Boom, that's right, Tanya, it's too high. Yes, that's why that's not the best answer. Letter B, sure, bend your knee, but you put all your weight on your back foot. Remember the game you're gonna play? Try to pick up your right foot, uh, your front foot, excuse me. Try and pick up your front foot. And you can use your fingers, but you're not gonna avoid injury by using your fingers. No one actually picked letter C, so good job. All right, couple of more, couple of more questions and then we're good. An independent contractor has some additional responsibilities. Some of those responsibilities are, A, file quarterly taxes after the first year of business. B, determine how much tax liability is owed to the county, state, and federal entities. C, determine if they will itemize deductions or take standard deductions. D, all of the above. Ooh, we got lots of answers coming in. Mm hmm Yes, yes, yes. On the type, yep, on the type of session. Yep, exactly. All right, can we eliminate a wrong answer here? Can we eliminate a wrong answer? Oop, I see a lot of people answering. Oh, Nuyo, Deborah, Paula, Tanya. Ready? Boom. It's all of the above. Something I didn't actually cover in uh, the class today is that after your first year as an independent contractor, it is a legal requirement. Not People don't do it all the time, but it is a requirement to go ahead and file quarterly taxes based on last year's income. So A is true, B is true, C is true. So those are all additional responsibilities in being an independent contractor. All right, last question, ready? True or false? Draping is only important when you don't know the client. A, true. New clients will be more comfortable with secure draping. B, false. Draping is important until you've established a rapport and trust. Then it's really up to the client. C, true. Because once you get to know the client, you can be less formal with your draping. D, false. Secure draping is always important. Oh, well, let's eliminate one wrong answer. Um, draping is never up to the client. If they would like to have their feet exposed, that's fine. If they would like to have their arms exposed, that's fine. But if they tell you they don't need draping, good for them. You need draping. It's about me. It's about you, not about the client. We want to, if they get warm, that's fine. We can give them little uh, areas of ventilation, but draping isn't, it's important when it's, it's, then it's not up to the client. That's the point. All right. But the majority of you guys got the correct answer because the best answer in this question, letter D, false. Secure draping is always important. So this was a true or false with a lot of little squigglies in there, right? Let's see, okay, good, nice job. I wanna just give a shout out to, yes, New York, Deborah, Paula, eh, la, 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 uh, Tanya, Angie, Juliana, New York, boom, boom, boom. You guys all got this one, good. Secure draping is always important. And there we are. Good job. Good job today. 
Can you imagine if we tried to go over medical terminology too? Woo, we'd be here till two o'clock or we'd be here for another 45 minutes. Yeah. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for the work you put in today. Thank you for your vision of you being a licensed massage therapist. When we come together in class like this, our collective energy is greater than the sum of its parts. Just by you being here today, just by you being here today, you have elevated the collective consciousness. You've given me energy. You've given all of your other classmates energy and vision. Because when we come together, we say, you're a massage therapist. You're a massage therapist. You're a massage therapist. I hold that vision for you and we hold it for each other. So thank you for doing that today. I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes with the students in case they have, not students, the graduates. Our graduates may have questions about how they're preparing for the MBLEX. So I'm going to stay on a few more minutes, but I wanted to close our recording uh, by simply saying uh, my name again is Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor for the MBLEX review course, and it's my pleasure and my privilege to work with you, to be with you on this part of your journey as you prepare to become a licensed massage therapist. See you again real soon.